everyone. Welcome to today's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name is Marisa Lagos, and I am a politics reporter for KQED and co-host of our show, Political Breakdown. And I am pleased to be your moderator for today's program. With me on stage is Max Boot, columnist for the Washington Post, senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and the author of a recent book, The Corrosion of Conservatism, Why I Left the Right. Max is a, a New York Times bestselling author and is widely acclaimed for his work in foreign policy and national security. In this recent book, he describes his journey leaving the Republican Party spurred by his disapproval of President Trump. Max offers a unique perspective on his old party and analyzes how conservative became what it is today. We are excited to have him here with us today to discuss the book. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Max Boot to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you very much. So there's, as always, probably 65 things that's happened in the last 24 hours that we should discuss. Um, but I want to start by going back to your childhood, because your book starts that way. And, and you talk about your own journey becoming and then, I guess, unbecoming a conservative. Um, and, and you talked about, and I, I heard you say recently, that your family's immigration from the Soviet Union made you blindly pro-American mm -hmm. um, for much of your life. Can you talk about what that, why that is, and then what's changed? Happy to do that, Marissa. I mean, first, let me just say thank you to the Commonwealth Club. This is actually my second time here uh, this year because this is my second book of the year, and it's, it's, I'll, I'll, if I keep getting invited to the Commonwealth Club, I'll keep writing books. So it's, it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, and thanks to Marissa for hosting this. Uh, you know, a lot of my uh, political identity is rooted in my personal identity, which I write about in the book, something I haven't really discussed much in the past. But indeed, as, as, as you mentioned, I immigrated here with my uh, mother and grandmother in 1976, age six, coming from Moscow to Southern California, quite a <laughs> vast difference in, in quality of life and, and, and everything else. Uh, and, you know, the... I was eager uh, to assimilate and, you know, so eager, in fact, that I actually don't speak Russian anymore. I, I wanted to learn English uh, and I wanted to become an American. And part of that was also becoming a conservative. And I was certainly attracted to uh, the Republican Party of the 1980s because it was so unapologetically anti-communist. I thrilled when Ronald Reagan spoke up for American values, called out the evil empires, said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And he had a real kind of moral clarity, which, which, was, which was very attractive to me. And he really, and speaking up for, for America and what we believe in, and, and that, that has been the faith that has really defined my life. I'm not, uh, although I'm you know, Jewish by background, I had my bar mitzvah in, at the Wilshire Boulevard Temple. Uh, I've never been all that religious, and I think I'm a little bit like John McCain, somebody that I revered and, and had the privilege to advise that, you know, Americanism has really been my religion, my faith in America as this great country that takes in people like me and, and so many others and allows us to become Americans in a way that's almost impossible anywhere else in the world. And so that's part of the reason why I am so incredibly outraged and offended by Donald Trump, because right before our eyes, I feel like he is defining, redefining the nature of America. And he is championing this kind of blood and soil chauvinistic conservatism that we have not seen a lot of in this country outside of, you know, a few folks like uh, uh, George Wallace and, and a few others. Uh, but he, I, I really feel like he is championing white identity at the expense of minorities, at the expense of immigrants. I mean, the way he is vilifying and demonizing uh, Latino immigrants and, and this caravan of refugees from Central America. Uh, it's just disgraceful. Uh, but one of the byproducts of this is that, A, I can no longer be uh, a Republican. I find it hard to be associated with the mainstream conservative movement, which has become basically a bunch of Trump apologists. But C, it's also causing me to re reassess this perhaps blind faith that I had in America and realize what probably a lot of other people realized a lot earlier than I did, that while it's still a great country, there are also some, uh, there's also, you know, a lot of things that we have to overcome and be ashamed about. And it's not just in the ancient past, it's right here and now. And we see that, and certainly the rise of the Trump phenomenon has alerted me to the extent to which racism and xenophobia and misogyny, all these things, Yes, maybe they're not as bad as they used to be, but they're still pretty bad, and these are still 
issues that we have to grapple with in a way that I would have never imagined when I was a, uh, you know, a naive young conservative columnist at the University of California at Berkeley in the in the early 1990s. So much to unpack there. It's funny. Um, one thing that surprised me. I actually have a subhead, all the ways you're not conservative. Um, <laughs> just things that I was reading through the book and listening to, th to, to your um, talks before, that there are, I mean, you've never been very socially conservative, but I think, um, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, it, you've kind of become woke in a way, right? Uh, around things yeah. like the Me Too movement and police brutality. Right. And why do you think that that has changed for you? Is, is, it, is that tied to Trump? Like, did you need that sort of counter to open your eyes to these things? I, I really did. I mean, it wasn't, it's not 100% Trump. I mean, there's also other phenomena like the Me Too movement that I've, you know, certainly uh, has awakened me uh, to the extent of this uh, atrocious behavior by so many men, something that I suspect women were pretty familiar with and that I was uh, pretty oblivious to. Also, just the spread of these uh, videotapes showing police brutality against minorities, especially against African Americans. Again, something that African Americans have known about and talked about a long time, and people like me just were not listening, and, and now I am. But I think the, the biggest spur for that reawakening is, is the Trump phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, because for years I heard liberals castigating Republicans for uh, pandering to racism, and I never believed it. I said, you know, hey, I'm not a racist, my friends aren't racist, what a terrible slur. And then it went from being a dog whistle to a wolf whistle, and, and, and Donald Trump was just so blatant and appealing to white prejudice that even I couldn't deny it anymore. I mean, I was truly shocked from the very beginning of his candidacy when he came down that damn escalator mm -hmm. at Trump Tower and started attacking Mexicans as rapists and murderers. I mean, I cannot believe that a mainstream politician can say something like that in America. Uh, and not just that he said it, but that he was rewarded politically for saying it. And that really made me think, oh my goodness, how on earth can my compatriots in the Republican Party be supporting somebody who is so blatant in his prejudice and bigotry? And that really made me realize that uh, that bigotry and prejudice have in fact been a big part of the Republican Party's appeal. Again, not news probably to a lot of people in this room, but I was so deep in my uh, ideological bunker, so, uh, so cut off in, in this kind of tribal identity as a Republican and a, and a conservative, I refused to see in the past what was obvious to a lot of other people, and now I can't deny it. So we're talking about two groups here, sort of the Republican base, which has elected Trump and, and continue to support him in large numbers, and then the sort of establishment. Um, and I want to talk about the establishment, but I, I was curious, like, what you see the roots of this in, because, I mean, you talk about him awakening something, but that means that it, it was there to begin with. Um, I know in your book you make a tie that I noticed Paul Krugman just made in a column, and I know you tried to hire him at the... Wall Street no, Journal. No, just tried to run a piece by him. <laughs> I don't think piece, I would, I would piece. not have been allowed to hire him. <laughs> um, but he made a similar point to you, which is basically saying that, you know, after the 2016 election, we talked a lot about this is about economic anxiety. And it seems like you're saying that it's actually more about racial resentment than economic anxiety. I mean, it, where do you think the roots of that lie? And is and, and are the establishment, the Republican Party is sort of partly to blame at all? Absolutely, the, the the Republican establishment has a lot to be to answer for, and more all more every day. I mean, I, look, I don't think that you know you something as as complex and as powerful as the Trump phenomenon it can't be explained by any one factor. I think there's multiple factors. I think the economic anxiety is certainly part of it. And I think I was blind to that, you know, cut off in not in this case, not in my. Uh, conservative Republican bubble, but in my New York bubble, you know, living in a pretty prosperous uh, blue state and, you know, not visiting, you know, uh, the, the Rust Belt, not visiting Pennsylvania and Wisconsin, so not, not really aware of the extent to which the changes in the global economy have hit those areas so hard. And that is, uh, that is pain and pain and resentment that Donald Trump has figured out how to mobilize very effectively. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at the studies of Trump voting patterns, uh, the poorest people are not the ones who are voting for Trump. They are voting for Hillary Clinton. Uh, the, the number one factor, I believe, behind the Trump phenomenon is white anxiety and white resentment of the changing face of America. I think the reason why 
you have Donald Trump is because we are on our way in the 2040s to becoming a majority minority nation, something that where California already leads the way. Uh, and there are a lot of older white people who are very unhappy about the state of affairs and and their resentment is stoked by Fox News and Breitbart and uh, all these other uh, Rush Limbaugh, all these other tribunes of the right. And they see something very threatening about what's going on. And and, you know, I think, again, organizations like Fox News are basically monetizing this fear and resentment. They're taking it, stoking it, taking advantage of it, making a lot of money. I mean, you know, people like Tucker Carlson and, and Sean Hannity are making tens of millions of dollars a year appealing to the worst angels of our nature. It's it's truly shocking. And in the case of Donald Trump, he's figured out how to uh, take advantage of that resentment, not so much for monetary gain, but for political gain. Uh, and that is you know, what he's doing right now. And you're seeing it ramped up to the nth degree right now because they're not, you know, Republicans are not running uh, uh, in, in the November election based on the tax cuts or economy. They're really running based on fear mongering and, uh, you know, demonizing again, this, this poor group of Central American refugees making it sound as if there's some kind of invading horde that's gonna rape and pillage uh, white America. Uh, well, like, not to mention the dog whistle about Middle Easterners being Right, yeah, with unknown Middle Easterners. Just Trump just makes stuff up. Um, and, I mean, this is just a, a very dangerous game that they are playing. And you're seeing it this week with uh, this terrorist campaign, all these bombs mailed to all of Donald Trump's targets. Right. I, want to um, talk I mean, about this that. is, you know, I, I was just writing last week that I, I feel like the social fabric is in danger of tearing. Uh, there could be violence in the streets. I think we're moving to that. And I think Donald Trump is doing it deliberately for political gain. Uh, he wants to provoke a reaction from the left. He wants to mobilize his, his, his followers. And he's doing it with the most deranged and extreme partisanship I think America has, has ever seen. I mean, he is denouncing Democrats for being, literally for being evil, literally for being traitors, for wanting to open the borders to uh, rapists and murderers, for being aligned with MS-13, for wanting to turn America into Venezuela, a failed socialist dictatorship. He's calling the media the enemy of the people. I mean, we are not used to this kind of rhetoric in America. I mean, we always have partisanship, but this is beyond partisanship. I mean, this is into the realm of authoritarian language uh, that that dictators use around the world to mobilize their followers. And this is just a very, very dangerous thing to do, which I think he is doing very cynically uh, to uh, for political gain. Well, that gets me to something I'm, I'm curious about, which is like, how much are we all sort of part of this breakdown in your mind? Um, you wrote in your book that you know, early early in the 2016 campaign that Trump's lack of restraint caused me to loosen my own restraints. Um, I felt reading it, though, that you were not maybe as pessimistic as some on the left about the sort of future of our democratic experiment, mm -hmm. but maybe not because of what you just said. Um, and, and one of the things that hit me was you talking about how he's not a full-blown fascist or dictator, but a garden variety strong man. Um, I guess my question would be then what so far, it does seem to some extent like the courts and, and the First Amendment and, you know, journalism and, and our institutions have held up in a lot of ways. Um, are you worried about that ability to continue given things like, you know, the threats of violence that we're seeing? I am concerned about what happens if, especially if Republicans were to win in this election, if they were to hold on to the House and Senate, I think that would basically be seen as a license by Trump. Uh, and his minions to do more of what they're doing to ramp it up. I mean, I would imagine that within hours of the election results, uh, Trump would probably be getting rid of most of the leadership of the Department of Justice, trying to get rid of Mueller, trying to stop the investigation of his own campaign, probably you know, announcing heinous new measures against uh, undocumented immigrants. Uh, so I think this would be a, a terrible signal to send, and I think it would be a truly dangerous signal for our democracy. Now, I don't you know, I don't think that Trump is actually going to succeed in, he's not gonna destroy our democracy, he's not gonna destroy fascism, uh, he's not gonna impose fascism, but I think those are his tendencies. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I say in the book, I, I see a lot of commonality between him and a lot of strongmen we've seen throughout history. Not, I, I, you know, I don't compare him to somebody like Hitler who is uniquely evil, but I do compare him to folks like, you know, Mussolini, Perón, Chavez, a lot of people with just authoritarian personalities, 
uh, no tolerance for dissent, a desire to stigmatize minorities for, for their own political gain. Uh, the difference, of course, is that Trump is not operating, you know, in, in 1920s Italy or 1950s Argentina or 2000 Venezuela. He's operating in the U.S. of A., which is one of the oldest and most durable constitutional republics in the world. So we have very strong checks and balances uh, to, to maintain our democracy, and I think we will. But nevertheless, what he's doing is, you know, he is corroding the democracy, undermining it, and he's certainly alienating his, uh, his supporters from, from mainstream truth and, and, main, and, and kind of basic democratic civility and practice. Well, I want to talk about the Republican Party, which you left, I believe, the day after the 2016 election. Indeed. Re-registered as an independent. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I, I want to know where you see the sort of start of this in the sense of do you blame, you know, the approach Newt Gingrich took in the 90s in terms of wedge issues and sort of, you know, the, what some people see as the beginning of this tribalism. Um, I've seen other folks, mostly on the left, but, you know, draw a line between that and then Mitch McConnell saying on day one, our goal is to basically stop everything Obama does and, of course, ending with the Supreme Court nomination. I mean, how much of the sort of mainstream do you think is to blame for not just Trump, but the sort of situation we see ourselves in when it comes to this, you know, tribalism, I think is the word we use the most often. Well, in the book, I trace it back even further than that to the very origins of the conservative movement. And, and Donald Trump's success in hijacking conservatism has made me re-examine what is American conservatism all about anyway. And so re doing things I'd never done before, like actually reading Barry Goldwater's book, The Conscience of a Conservative, reading Phyllis Schlafly's book, A Choice, Not an Echo, and what I find in there is, to paraphrase, an echo of Trumpism, essentially, that there was a lot of this stuff floating around in the 50s and, and 60s. I mean, if you read descriptions of the 1964 Republican Convention, which occurred right here in this city, uh, there were a lot of moderate Republicans, including folks like Henry Kissinger and Jackie Robinson and others, who were terrified by the vehemence of the Goldwater supporters and very, very much the same kind of reaction that I have today watching watching Trump rallies. And if you read, for example, Phyllis Schlafly's best-selling book, A Choice Not an Echo, I mean, it is full of the craziest conspiracy mongering where she says, you know, why are Republicans losing presidential elections? It never occurs to her because maybe the Democrats have a more attractive candidate or the Republicans are pushing a platform that isn't very popular, whatever. No, her answer is that there's a small group of financiers in New York who have hijacked the Republican Party and are basically in league with the Soviet Union and want to destroy the Republican Party so as to facilitate communism in America. I mean, this is as crazy as it sounds, but this was a best-selling, it sold millions of copies in the 60s and 70s, and Phyllis Schlafly rose to prominence opposing ERA in the 1970s. So there's a lot of this craziness at the very origins of the modern conservative movement, but I don't want to say that this is entirely defined the totality of conservatism, because I think there's also been much more high-minded and principled uh, conservatism, and in office, most, and in fact, pretty much all Republican presidents up until now have been much more moderate than their campaign rhetoric would suggest, including Ronald Reagan and, and George H.W. Bush and others. So the way I put it is that basically before you had this kind of crazy fringe and then a conservative mainstream, but now Trump has taken the craziness from the fringe and put it right into the center of the party. And unfortunately, most Republicans are happy to go along with that. So how do you define conservatism as you viewed it before you left the right, so to speak? Well, it's, it's an amorphous term, and everybody has their definition. To me, it, what, it basically, what, what conservatism is about is a dedication to limited government, economic opportunity, uh, rather than guaranteed economic outcomes, uh, a commitment to American global leadership, standing up for the principles upon which our country is founded, life, liberty, and the, and the pursuit of happiness, uh, uh, being very inclusive, being pro-immigration, uh, being very realistic and making policy assessments based on looking at the evidence rather than having an a priori ideological commitment. And I saw a lot of those tendencies in uh, the Republican Party when I was growing up in the 1980s uh, and even into the 90s, but not so much anymore. And, and to go back to your earlier question, I think you know the trends that got us to Trump have really, you can really see him coming into focus in the 1990s with Newt Gingrich, 
uh, the creation of Fox News, which I think has been one of the most disastrous developments in modern American political history. And then you had Sarah Palin, then you had the Tea right. Party. So all these things have moved the Republican Party further and further to the right and away from the kind of conservatism that I believe in and into essentially uh, white nationalism is, is what it amounts to. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, I wish I could say this is not conservatism, but it is conservatism. It's a different kind of conservatism. It's the kind that they've always had in Europe. And in this country, it's the kind of conservatism associated with folks like Joe McCarthy, George Wallace, John Calhoun back in the 19th century. There is this, Pat Buchanan more recently, there is this con alternative conservative tradition, which I find to be pernicious and dangerous, but that is the one that, that Donald Trump represents. You mentioned earlier that you had advised uh, Senator McCain. Do you think he regretted the Sarah Palin decision? Well, he said he did, yeah. I mean, uh, in his last book, published a few months before he died, he in fact said he regretted it. He wished he had chosen Joe Lieberman. Yeah. So. It seems like there's been a, a trade-off made by many folks in the Republican establishment, who some of whom used to be your friends, and I know you talk about the fact that you've lost friends, that for all of you know the problems with Trump, it's worth it to get conservative judge, you know, judges and justices, for example, to get the tax cut policy that they wanted. Um, those are different issues, but I guess to start with uh, on the judges issue, like how, how do you view that? And you know, as somebody who is conservative, how do you view the recent um, Kavanaugh hearings? Maybe we can talk about the sexual harassment allegations, but more just like, is he in line with what you see as a conservative justice? And is there any argument you can see for sort of the trade-off that's been made? Well, I can see how Republicans convince themselves that the trade-off is worth it. In my mind, it's not a close call. It's not worth it. I've changed my mind on some of these issues. I actually wrote a book about the legal system in the late 1990s in which I parroted kind of mindlessly a lot of this Republican uh, conservative ideology about the need for uh, original intent in judging and the dangers of activist judges and so forth. And I've rethought about a lot of that in recent years and really realized that Republicans don't really care about the rule of law. They don't really care about original intent. They're a lot like uh, the Democrats that they attack. They just want policy outcomes out of the judiciary. And in the case of the rule of law, I mean, it's kind of laughable that Republicans are saying, you know, we need conservative justices to uphold the rule of law when they're looking for those appointments from Donald Trump, somebody who is mounting the most full-throated assault on the rule of law in American history and who is actively committing obstruction of justice in plain sight. I mean, I was... In, in terms of Brett Kavanaugh, what I wrote at the, when he was nominated is, this guy is, is more conservative than I am. I would be more comfortable with somebody in the, in the manner of Anthony Kennedy or Sandra Day O'Connor, kind of a very centrist justice. But I thought he was very well qualified. And I said, hey, I may disagree with this guy, but I think he should be confirmed because he meets the basic qualification tests. Now, I changed Did my that mind. Did change after I, the hearings? Yeah, I mean, it changed my mind after the hearing. Uh, because, A, I don't think there was ever a full and fair investigation made of Dr. Ford's charges against him. But B, I was also just shaken by his performance at this at the second hearing where, OK, I get that, you know, if, if he feels like he was wrongly accused, he has a right to be outraged. But I feel like he went beyond that into uh, kind of part partisan name calling and conspiracy mongering and charging. This was all payback for the Clintons. That to me does not reveal a judicious temperament. And, and I think he is, you know, the fact that he's now on the court is going to undermine the legitimacy and the nonpartisan aura that the Supreme Court needs to have in order to, to function effectively. All right, one more question on this and then we can move on. But I just, one of the things that has been most sort of shocking to me is the religious rights sort of blind support of Trump. Um, and I assume it's tied in some ways to these th this issue of judges and right. Roe v. Wade and, and some of these yeah. like social issues. But I don't know, have you had any conversations that has shed light on that w with people that you know? Because it's yeah. it just seems so antithetical to what they have talked about in the past. Right, it's, it's, it's confounding. I mean, what it basically comes down to is they are hoping that Trump will appoint judges who will outlaw abortion, who will outlaw gay marriage, uh, basically legislate their social agenda from the bench. And in return for that, they are willing to turn a blind eye to the flagrant immorality or maybe amorality of this president. I mean, it's mind-blowing to me. I mean, I'm old enough to remember 
uh, the, the Clinton impeachment in the 1990s and what conservatives and Republicans were saying about Bill Clinton. I mean, I have, have a copy and have been rereading uh, Bill Bennett's book, The Death of Outrage, which came out, I think, in 1998 where he was thundering on that it doesn't matter that the economy is going great, it doesn't matter that Bill Clinton is, is successful on a policy level, he is demeaning our nation, he is destroying our moral fiber, he is dragging us down, we can't have this, this so-and-so uh, as our chief executive. And then I think, wait a second, people like Bill Bennett and all these, other, and all these evangelicals, now they, they support somebody who is 10 times worse than Bill Clinton. I mean, Bill Clinton was a choir boy compared to Donald Trump. I mean, <laughs> what would they be saying if a Democrat were caught breaking campaign finance laws to pay off a Playboy playmate and a porn star? I mean, can you imagine the kind of meltdown they would be having on Fox News? But because it's Donald Trump, they turn a blind eye to anything, any kind of transgression you could possibly imagine, and they're basically subordinating their religious beliefs to their political agenda. I mean, there's a handful of evangelicals, folks like Pete Weiner and Mike Gerson, I think have been very eloquent in denouncing what their fellow evangelicals, white evangelicals are doing. Uh, but to me, I mean, I'm not of that community, but this is not, I don't think this is their finest hour. And imagine if it had been Barack Obama doing it, a black right, of man. Course. <laughs> no, I mean, this, I mean, let's remember, like in the days of President Obama, it was considered a scandal that he wore a tan suit or right. put, <laughs> put his feet up on the desk in the Oval Office. I mean, Or didn't wear a flag pin once, I think was. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, <laughs> just the stuff that people were outraged about by, by Obama and the things that they're not outraged about Trump is just shows you how cynical and partisan all of this is. Well, you talk about how you you know you viewed um, politics as about ideas versus party. Um, I was and, very naive. <laughs> and partisanship is a sort of laziness in a way because there is this pressure to conform. Um, I mean, are you are you hopeful that you left the party? So maybe that answers the question that Republicans could swing this back in the other direction. I think the only way that Republicans will swing it back is if they see that following the Trump approach is not going to be a formula for political success. And that's why, as somebody who was a lifelong Republican and is now an independent, not a Democrat, nevertheless, I'm urging everybody to go out there and vote and work for Democrats in the midterm election because I think it's essential to elect Democrats, not only to get a check and balance on Donald Trump, something that Republicans have shown they will not do, but frankly, it's essential to vote for Democrats to save the Republican Party from itself. Uh, because if they are rewarded politically for what they are doing now, you're going to have more of this. It's going to get worse. Uh, the racism, xenophobia, misogyny, all the rest of it is going to be amped up to the nth degree by, by 2020. The attacks on minority groups and undocumented immigrants, it's all going to be get much, much worse. The obstruction of justice, it's all going to get much, much worse. Uh, you know, I basically concluded that Republican office holders have no principles. They just have poll numbers. But if the poll numbers change and all of a sudden they see that following Trump over the cliff is not necessarily a winning strategy, I think a lot of them are cynical enough to, to reverse course. But first, you've got to convince them that they're not going to get ahead doing this. And sadly, pretty much the entire Republican Party at this point has bought into the Trump approach. That answers an audience question I just got, which was, do you see any current Republicans in Congress organizing to counter the Trump agenda? It seems like most of them just decided to resign. Yeah, I mean, the ones who are unhappy with what's going on are leaving and in part because, or in large part, because they couldn't win re-election, like Jeff Flake, for example. There's just not been much of a pushback. Now, my hope is that there will still be some Republican who will be brave enough to take on Trump in 2020, and I think there is the chance for somebody to do reasonably well in a state like New Hampshire, mm. John Kasich, somebody like that, I mean, it's gonna be a suicide mission. They're not gonna take away the nomination from, from Trump, but nevertheless, a, a, a real challenger could do some real damage to Trump, I think, in the way that, for example, from the other side, Pat Buchanan did real damage to President Bush in 1992. Yeah, I got a I got an audience question um, that I want to piggyback on something I wanted to ask you about, which is how can we be called a democracy when almost three million voters were disenfranchised? Um, I guess that's an allusion to the Electoral College, but I wanted to ask you more broadly about the idea of voting rights and and that that had become way before Trump a, a seeming strategy of the Republican Party in a lot of places to, you know actively promote policies that primarily would result in people of color having a harder time voting. And we're seeing this in Georgia right now, allegations of it. Right. Um, 
and then of course there's gerrymandering, which both parties have right. <laughs> it, uh, entered into um, and often made deals in state houses around. But I, I mean, do you see that? What's your view of that? Do you see that as cynical? Do you think it's um, it, it's has anything to do with how successful Republicans have been in the House and in state houses? I mean, I think that is certainly a Republican strategy, which we're seeing now in Georgia and some other places, which certainly contributes to their electoral success. But there are a lot of other factors at play as well, including redistricting and including just the very basic nature of our political system, which gives a massive advantage uh, to small states right. with very little population, which is why, you know, you keep having uh, Republican presidents who are winning a minority of the popular vote and, you know, Trump losing the popular vote to, to Clinton by almost three million people uh, and basically becoming president because he won 80,000 votes in three states. I mean, that is a source of frustration uh, and it's, you know, it's baked into our our political system. But of course, uh, you know, the population imbalance is much greater today than it was in 1789. When you look at the number of people who live in blue states versus red states, it's it's a huge disparity, which is why Democrats can win so many popular votes and still lose the lose the presidency. And so, you know, you basically have, you know, justices being put on the Supreme Court by a small minority of the population. I mean, that is that is very frustrating. But I honestly don't know what the solution is because you know, to change the Constitution, <laughs> you've got to get the, the small states on board, and why would they ever vote to d basically deny themselves power? Right. Well, let's talk about the election. What, what, you want to make some bets here? <laughs> Tell no. us what's going to happen. No. <laughs> um, I, I went out of the political betting business when I was sure that, A, Donald Trump would not win the Republican nomination, and, B, that he would not win the presidency. So at this yeah. point, all bets are off. I, I'm with you. Um, uh, but I mean, how how 12 days out do you think it looks for Democrats? And, and um, you know, what I mean, to me, it seems like the common wisdom and the asterisk being that the common wisdom 12 days out from 2016 was that Hillary Clinton would be president. But is that Democrats are in a fairly strong position around the House and not so good in the Senate? Yeah, I mean, I don't have any reason to challenge that that conventional wisdom, but I just would you know urge people not to be complacent about yeah. that, as I think a lot of people were complacent about Hillary Clinton in 2016. What do you think a Democratic House, I mean, besides the obvious investigations, but like what would that do in D.C. to this presidency, even if the Republicans keep the Senate? Well, I mean, if you think that we have bitter partisan warfare right now, you ain't seen nothing yet mm -hmm. uh, because it's going to get ramped up dramatically, especially if and when Mueller delivers his report. Uh, and if, you know, imagine what happens if he does find serious wrongdoing on the part of, of the president. Uh, I mean, I don't think that Democrats are eager necessarily to rush into impeachment as the first order of business because they're afraid it's not going to be popular. But, you know, I, and, and I think that's proper. I think they should wait for the Mueller report. But, but you know, if Mueller does find serious misconduct, collusion, obstruction of justice, and quite possibly also financial fraud, on the part of the president. At that point, I think Democrats are obligated, A, by their constitutional duties, and B, by their base, to move uh, articles of impeachment. And that will not be hard to do in the House if the Democrats have a majority. But obviously, it's going to be Armageddon in the Senate. And it's going to be very probably impossible to remove him because you're not going to get 67 votes. But you know, remember how bitter uh, the, the, the partisan battle was over the Clinton impeachment it would be much more bitter today because Bill Clinton had some scruples. Donald Trump does not. Uh, so he will use uh, every tool in his, in his toolkit, mobilize his most rabid supporters uh, to defeat uh, any kind of impeachment. And there's a real risk, which I think a lot of Democrats are afraid of, that it will backfire. It will make it, he will be able to paint the Democrats as trying to subvert the will of the people. And then you know, use a failed impeachment, just as Bill Clinton did, to essentially rebound in popularity. Mm -hmm. And in Donald Trump's case, that Donald Trump's case, that could mean uh, winning re-election in 2020. So, with that in mind, I mean, who who do you see, or what type of candidate do you see as the biggest threat to Trump in 2020? I think a moderate, boring white guy, basically, is probably uh, the most politically potent. Uh, alternative to Trump, somebody who can essentially wean away 
some of those very anxious and resentful white voters that he mobilized in industrial states so effectively, uh, you know, maybe paired with a uh, with a uh, person of color as as the vice president. I mean, this is why I think a lot of people there's a lot of speculation like a Biden Harris ticket, for example, could be a successful. Is Biden one. moderate? I, he's pretty moderate. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly more so I would say than a Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth right. Warren. I mean, look, from my I mean, from my perspective, I would say the Democrats have a once in a generation or even maybe even more than that opportunity here to realign American politics in the way that it was realigned in the 1930s and in the 1960s when the parties fundamentally changed. And I think there are a lot of centrists and a lot of Republicans, former Republicans, who are unhappy with this Trumpified Republican Party. I mean, remember, the largest political party in America are the independents, about 42% right. of the electorate compared to about 29% Democrats, 27% Republicans. So there's a lot of people who are not affiliated with the party right now and are looking for an alternative. So I think if the Democrats can move to the center and nominate somebody who is pretty centrist and moderate and not threatening, I think there is a chance to pick up a huge block of support and basically crush the Republican Party and leave them, you know, basically with their Fox News base and, and, and very little else. But, uh, you know, my fear of the Democrats is what Abba Ibn said about the Palestinians. They never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And so my fear is that instead they will go far to the left uh, because progressive activists are so fired up by Trump, and understandably so. But my concern is that they will then nominate somebody like Senator Warren or, or, Sen or Senator Sanders, who is going to thrill the base, but could wind up easily losing to Donald Trump and will turn off a lot of middle-of-the-road voters. And I think that would be a, a disaster, not just for the Democratic Party, but for America. Because I think we really need a, a centrist party in this country, and at the moment, uh, that's that's a position that remains to be filled. I wonder, hearing you talk about this, if there is an opening for a new political party. I mean, it seems for so long we've sort of rolled our eyes at that. But as you've mentioned, you know, in no party preference voters have grown exponentially, even in deep blue states like California. And I think, you know, you hit on something. Um, There's a new poll out today here about where they looked at some of these congressional races and you know, independents are really the ones in play in, the, in, in, in this quest to flip the House for Democrats. Um, and they don't have a great view of either party. So is that, I mean, is that an opportunity or is... Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I feel like we're kind of trapped in this two-party duopoly because of the way our system is structured. And that's the way we've, we've done it. You know, we haven't had a new party arise since the 1850s. So we're just, we kind of go along. But more and more of the population is not happy with that status quo. And you've seen, uh, you know, you've seen it, some evidence of that at the ballot box. I mean, remember in, uh, in 1992 how well uh, Ross Perot did. I mean, he got about 20% of the vote, even though he left the race in the middle and he was a pretty squirrely character. I mean, but even look at, you know, Donald Trump. I mean, he's not a hardcore Republican. He has no real history of the Republican Party. He was basically an independent who came in and took over the Republican Party. And theoretically, an independent could come in and take over the Democratic Party, too. I mean, in the book, what I suggest is that it's a moonshot. It's truly a long shot. But I would love to see an American Macron, somebody like uh, Macron in France, who runs as a centrist, not affiliated with either of the two major parties. And I think there is a chance, maybe it's an outside chance, but there is a chance for somebody like that, if that person is credible, well-funded, charismatic, somebody like that could win, especially if the choices on offer are, you know, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. I think that leaves a lot of room in the middle. <laughs> I, I got to ask this. Uh, would President Pence be worse? Well... That's a great question. <laughs> no, I would say no. I mean, I disagree with Mike Pence uh, on many issues, but I don't think he is personally unhinged and erratic in the way that Donald Trump is. I mean, that's the, the real danger with Trump is not just how extreme his views are, but just that he is personally so unfit for office, whereas Pence, I think in many ways, is a right-wing extremist, but he's kind of a boring personality type. Right. He's not incendiary in the way that, that Donald Trump is. I mean, the 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 really pernicious thing is that people like Mike Pence have remolded themselves uh, to basically become mini me's of Donald Trump. I don't think that's that's where they started out, but that's the effect that Donald Trump is having on the party. 
Well, let's talk a little bit about foreign affairs because that's your area of expertise um, and there has been a lot going on. I want to ask about your Washington Post colleague, Jamal Khashoggi, and the Trump administration's reaction. Um, this is another story that's been changing by the day. I think the Saudis today acknowledge this was premeditated. Right. If, yeah, if it's Wednesday, it must be a new story. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I mean, what have you made of this? Or Thursday. What day Thursday, is it? Thursday. What day Thursday. is it? Yeah. I'm on book tour. I don't know what day <laughs> of the week it is. Um, uh, given everything we've discussed so far, I mean, is there anything that surprises you about the way the president has responded? Well, sadly, no. I mean, I'm disappointed, but not surprised. I mean, if you look at Donald Trump, he is more outraged, genuinely outraged by Canadian milk tariffs than he is by the murder and dismemberment of this journalist, uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, who wrote for the same newspaper that I write for, The Washington Post. I mean, he is a president utterly devoid of a moral compass. Uh, he uh, basically worships dictators. I mean, he thinks that Putin is great. He's strong. He will not criticize him. He says he is in love with Kim Jong-un, who is one of the worst dictators on the planet. He is basically given uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of, of Saudi Arabia, MBS, a blank check to do whatever he wants. I mean, remember, this is not the first outrage from MBS. Last year, MBS kidnapped the Prime Minister of Lebanon. This year, he kicked out uh, the Canadian ambassador because Canada dared to criticize Saudi human rights abuses. They're also carrying out this horrific war in Yemen, which is killing so many innocent people. They're uh, uh, embargoing cutters. So they've done, the Saudis have done a lot of bad things. And I think as they've done these things with no pushback from President Trump, and as they listen to President Trump refer to the media as the enemy of the people, I'm sure MBS thought, hey, great, I can just kill this pesky journalist who dares to criticize me, and America won't care. And I think that's basically the message you're getting from Trump is he really does not care that much. I think the, the, the one surprise here, I think maybe for MBS and Trump is that a lot of people in America do care and there has been a lot of blowback in Congress But basically I don't think there's going to be any real consequences for Saudi Arabia Unless Congress takes action which is possible because they could for example very easily cut off US arms for the uh, Saudi war in Yemen Do you I mean that's so interesting that, that you think that message is why they did it because it has seemed even for a regime that has done all the things you just said, just so blatant. Um, and obviously, you know, it happened in Turkey and there's no love lost there, but they have their own problematic leader, I would say. Um, I mean, is this something you, th it sounds like you don't think we would have seen this under another administration, that they would not have dared to do something like well, this. Well, I mean, it's hard to know. And I don't want to, you know, I don't want to put the blame directly on Trump because obviously the actual culprits who did this, the Saudis, I mean, they are right. the criminals here. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously there have been a lot of dictatorships that have done a lot of bad things long before Donald Trump came into office. But I do feel like, as I wrote not too long ago, Trump has basically given every dictator on the planet a license to kill uh, fairly secure. There's not going to be any real American reaction because he, his is, I believe, the most amoral U.S. foreign policy ever. And it's really all about the bottom line, which is why he gets exercised about countries that have a trade surplus with the United States, but doesn't really care about countries that go out and murder dissidents. I mean, for example, the way that Putin has done in, in the UK. I want to talk about Russia. I did want to ask about just one of the things that has surprised me the most has been, maybe it shouldn't, but this campaign among right-wing media to try to discredit Khashoggi, it's that is so disgusting. There is so much disgusting filth on the right these days. It's hard to know where to start. I mean, also just in, in the last day or so when, you know, you had this terrorist campaign against people like the Clintons and President Obama and right. CNN and so forth. And the immediate reaction of so many on the right is it's a false flag operation. It's the Democrats who are responsible or, you know, they see a caravan of Central American refugees. It's George Soros, i.e. it's the Jews who are responsible. And you see the same kind of filth with, with Jamal Khashoggi saying, well, you know, he's really a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He's an Islamic terrorist sympathizer. So basically, he deserved what was coming and who cares? I mean, this is so outrageous, so lacking in humanity. I, I just, words fail me here. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you have some thoughts on Russia and our president's uh, like 
love affair, maybe we could call it, with Vladimir Putin. Right. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting is the argument you hear a lot um, from Republicans and, and the administration is, don't pay any mind to what the president's saying. Look at our policies. Right. Um, we just pulled out of this you know, arms uh, treaty. Um, what... I mean, what's your reaction to that framing of this, that, you know, words don't matter, actions do, basically? Well, I think words do matter when they come from the president of the United States. They do send a strong signal for good or for ill. In terms of Russia policy, I would say the best way to characterize the administration is inconsistent and confusing and, and all over the place. Uh, because they certainly have done some things to get tough with Russia, like sending lethal arms to Ukraine, imposing some sanctions. But remember, those sanctions were really imposed by Congress with overwhelming bipartisan majorities. Trump was opposed, but he had to sign the bill because it was going to get passed anyway. Uh, and some of his aides have certainly been uh, eager to uh, to hold Putin's feet to the fire. But then, you know, you've seen the reporting when Donald Trump finds out, for example, that he signed off on a mass expulsion of Russian diplomats in retaliation for the Russian attempt to poison a dissident in the UK, he then gets outraged. He didn't realize that he signed off on this mass <laughs> I expulsion. I did not realize that. Yes. Um, so you basically have several different Russia policies. You have one of the Trump aides who are by and large hardliners on Russia. Then you have Trump himself who had the most em embarrassing and obsequious performance uh, in front of Vladimir Putin at Helsinki. Uh, such that you had people, very credible people like John Brennan, the former CIA director, openly questioning uh, whether uh, Trump has been compromised by Putin because it's hard to explain the way that he fawns all over Putin in any other manner. So the administration itself has been uh, has been inconsistent. They've done some some good things on Russia, some bad things. But Trump himself never says one bad word about Putin, which is pretty striking because he has bad words about pretty much everybody else. Um, I have several questions from the audience about the tariffs and kind of their impact on our economy and the world supply chain. Um, do you, I guess to sort of frame this as a question to start, do you think that that could have a political impact on this president's success? Well, absolutely. I mean, look at what's happened to the stock market. It's down for the year. It's down since the Republicans passed their big tax cut package. And the Which you're a huge fan of. <laughs> yes, I, I, I was not a huge fan of it. Um, uh, and, and the tariffs are just beginning to bite because Trump just imposed like $250 billion worth of tariffs on Chinese goods. And those are just now starting to affect the bottom line. And so the Wall Street Journal just had a story, I think, today or yesterday saying that on about a third of the earnings calls for S&P 500 companies, about a third of them referred to the impact of the tariffs. And a lot of companies are suffering massive hits. I mean, I think Ford Motor Company has said uh, they're, they're losing a billion dollars because of the tariffs. So that's rippling through the economy. I think that's contributing to the downturn in the stock market. And, you know, Trump doesn't quite know how to respond. I was fascinating in this Wall Street Journal interview where he actually denied that he had imposed any tariffs. I mean, he is living in some kind of alternative reality. Yeah, it's so interesting to me, too, because the places where those tariffs are hitting the hardest in a lot of ways are, are were his base to win in 2016. Sure, yeah, I mean, which is why, the, you know, they're uh, imposing these tariffs. Farmers are getting hit. Now they're spending like $10 billion to bail out farmers. Maybe instead of spending this taxpayer money to subsidize the farmers, maybe just skip the tariffs and just let the farmers sell their goods. How about that? Yeah. Well, let's talk about the tax cut a little, because um, it seems like that was what Republicans had anticipated running on. It seems like, you know, that was um, a big part of some of the donors coming over to Trump's side in 2016. Absolutely. But we're looking at a deficit. I mean, yeah, it's bigger than ever. Yeah. No, I mean, I think this is kind of an indication of how the Republican Party has really been stuck in outdated dogma. And basically, ever since Reagan's 1981 tax cut, Republicans, have, uh, every time they get into power, they think that the answer to everything is a tax cut. Well, I think the Reagan 81 tax cut actually made sense because we were in a very deep recession and you wanted to stimulate the economy. But when Trump took over, we were not in a recession. We were in a booming economy. And so what he's basically doing is he's adding a sugar high to an already strong economy at the risk of massive fiscal consequences down the road. They're roughly doubling the deficits that he inherited from President Obama. We're going to have trillion dollar deficits as far as the eye can see. And it's I mean, if you just go back and look at the quotes from people like Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, 
when the when the federal debt level was much lower. They were saying this is unsustainable. It's going to threaten the future of our democracy. We can't live with these federal debt levels. And now the debt is much higher and getting higher all the time. And they're suddenly falling silent. The debt doesn't matter to them. Fiscal responsibility doesn't matter to them. Again, I'm still somebody who, who believes in, in fiscal responsibility, which is why I can't support this. One of many reasons <laughs> I can't support this Republican Party. You brought up Paul Ryan. I mean, what is the deal with that? It, 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 I mean, because he did seem like, you know, Mitch McConnell, I think, <laughs> likes winning. Yep. Right. That's right. that seems to be yes. his uh, religion. No, absolutely. But Paul Ryan, at least until Trump, was a true fiscal conservative. I thought he was, too. I mean, he's been a colossal disappointment. I mean, I look at it exactly as you did. I mean, I'm not disappointed in Mitch McConnell because I think he's basically cynical and has no ideology between accruing political aside from accruing political power. So I'm not surprised by Mitch yeah. McConnell. But Paul Ryan always pretended to be a, a different beast. And he spoke about himself as a Jack Kemp re leading heart Republican. He said that, you know, the debt level was unsustainable. We needed to reform entitlement spending, which was a, a, a brave thing for a politician to say. And so I, I was really supportive of Paul Ryan. I thought he was the future of the Republican Party. And he broke my heart because... You know, his legacy is going to be higher debt. It's going to be s staying silent while the president engages in the most flagrant, uh, you know, race baiting and and uh, and minority bashing. Paul Ryan just, you know, pretends he doesn't listen to what Trump, Donald Trump says. Uh, you know, it's there. He's he's one of a number of people who have really deeply disappointed me about this Republican Party. I know. I noticed in that uh, New York Times profile of him, he he's always saying, "Oh, I don't, what did the president say?" But then he was like reading tweets to the yeah. reporter, so he might have some Twitter notifications right. it's, it's on there. Very selective hearing loss on his part. Um, I have a question from the audience asking, "Can you explain the climate denialism among otherwise educated, informed politicians?" Um, when I want to talk about climate change more broadly, but I guess maybe you could just start with where you stand on the issue. Well, I, I mean, I think climate change is a real problem. I mean, just look at the rising temperatures at all the, the record number of hurricanes. I mean, clearly this is an issue that we need to confront. And it's staggering to me that Republicans basically are denying reality. But, you know, this is part of this larger trend where I think Republicans have pulled further and further away from reality. I mean, when if they if they think based on some random comment from Donald Trump that you know, that there's Middle Eastern terrorists in the Central American caravan and it's all being funded by George Soros. And it's not that surprising that they think that global warming is a Chinese hoax. But this is a very dangerous position for one of our two major parties to adopt because they are basically irrational, illogical, and denying basically accepted scientific facts in favor of whatever political fiction Fox News is peddling at that moment. So, you know, climate denialism, I think, is just part of the larger Republican war on reality, which you're seeing at the moment. I mean, what should the conservative approach to it be? What would be the free market sort of approach? Well, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on, on climate change, but I think, you know, a carbon tax is a solution that a lot of economists think makes a lot of sense. And that's something that would, I, I think would make sense. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, pulling out of the Paris climate accord is going the wrong way. Um, I mean, I, you know, I think a, a conservative approach would acknowledge that there you have to weigh economic costs and benefits, but you can't simply ignore the reality of climate change or just pretend that if if we do nothing, everything will be okay. It's not that's I mean that's that's not a tenable position. It doesn't seem like it's one though that the Democrats have done a very good job of running on or sort of figuring out a messaging strategy well, around. Yeah, let me let me tell you something that the host of a major television talk show that many of you are familiar with. What he told me, I'm not going to name the, the host, but uh, this host said to me, you know, we can't we can't talk about uh, global warming because it's a ratings loser. People don't care. They don't tune in. We don't get eyeballs by talking about climate change. I mean, that's that's a very real politic uh, uh, reaction. Wow. Uh, I think people are just depressed by it, probably. But I can't be. imagine that the rest of the news <laughs> is that uplifting. Um, you talked earlier. You mentioned the president's sort of, on one hand, law and order approach to, say, immigration, but then he's had, you know, this massive fight with the intelligence community, the FBI in particular, um, and, it, and it just seems, and of course the attacks on the judiciary, um, 
I'm curious, like, where you think that has landed in the general public and, and the risks you see. Well, it is pretty rich that the Republican Party, which claims to be the party of law and order, the party of supporting law enforcement, is now mounting the most outrageous and unprecedented assault on America's premier law enforcement agency, the FBI. Uh, I mean, this is so shameful and led by folks like Devin Nunes. Uh, they're basically making obstruction of justice a core platform of the Republican Party. I, this is something I, n I never thought I would live to see the day, frankly. Uh, I mean, they're, uh, they're uh, you know, turning Robert Mueller, this Republican career prosecutor, universally respected until this probe, they're turning him into some kind of caricature claiming that he is a handmaiden of the Democrats, that, that Bob Mueller is somehow a Democratic operative and pretending that the FBI is ideologically opposed to Donald Trump. I mean, let's get real here, okay? The FBI is primarily made up of middle-aged cops, okay? Middle-aged cops are not ideologically opposed to Donald Trump, okay? If anything, I'm sure they would be predisposed to favor him if he were not, in fact, mounting an unrelenting assault on their objectivity and independence, which is what he is doing. And the fact that the, F that the Republican Party is going along with this, I think, is, is one of the most outrageous things that has happened uh, in the Trump era. Well, there's also like an interesting split within law enforcement because you see, I think on the local level, um, you know, the, these smaller agencies endorsing him, going to these rallies, um, right. you know, the Joe Pio uh, uh, pardon, preemptive pardon. Um, I mean, I is there any... Yeah, not preemptive. Uh, Sheriff Joe was actually convicted. He was convicted. And there's yeah. another, is there another, I think there's another case that, there's a question as yeah. to whether that could be preventive. Um, well, I, I actually wanted to ask, you are a journalist. That's how you started your career. You, um, well, I guess I'm, I'm still a journalist of a sort since I am a Washington Post columnist. Yes. So. I, I wonder how you grade the work on the news side that papers like the New York Times and the Post are doing, um, who the, you know, the president has so vociferously attacked. Uh, well, to put it into, into movie re reviewer terms, Two thumbs up. <laughs> um, I think the press is really doing an outstanding job. That's one of the silver linings of the Trump era. I think it has uh, given a, you know, a, a fresh burst of life and purpose uh, to the major media organizations. And I think the Post and the Times have really been at the forefront of holding Trump to account, bringing the truth out. And you just think about how many jaw-dropping stories have emerged. I mean, just this week, the Times had that fabulous piece and how Donald Trump is using his cell phone to have ins unsecure conversations uh, that are being eavesdropped on by the Chinese. This is after, you know, he made the Hillary Clinton email server one of his core campaign issues. And then, you know, just about a month ago, the Times had this another fantastic expose about how Donald Trump and his family are basically guilty of a massive long-term tax fraud, which seems to have you know, faded out of public consciousness, but it's worth remembering the Post, you know, has, has had many fabulous uh, exposés as well. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know where this country would be without him, and I think it's, it's, it's telling the kind of animus that Donald Trump has against the news media. Even today, you know, a day after CNN received a letter bomb, he's still attacking the news media, you know, still saying that basically the... Uh, the the violence in the country and and the incivility it's all the media's fault because they dare to criticize him in essence and you know the media is certainly not going to stop doing its job and, and thank goodness that they're there do you think there's any political legs to the tax issue political legs just i mean you know donald trump refused to release his taxes oh, you oh, had tax this fraud. huge yeah well not investigation a, right right no, I mean, this is one of these many things that just seems to drop down the memory hole. I mean, we, we also seem to forget the fact that, you know, in, in mid-August, Michael Cohen, Trump's lawyer, pleaded guilty to eight felonies and implicated Donald Trump in two of those. So you basically have an unindicted co-conspirator as president of the United States. And we forget because there's so many outrages that, that take precedence. And I think part of it is because, you know, it the press, those of us in the media, we are subject to some extent to chasing 
you know, whatever story comes up that day. And every day there's like 10 new outrages from the White House that you wind up writing about. So it's hard to keep a consistent focus on the really big outrage that came out last month or, or last year. And that's where I think it would be very helpful if you did have Democrats in control, at least of the House, because if they start to hold hearings, if they start to subpoena documents, if they start to do investigations, that in turn will drive the news cycle. It won't be just Trump's crazy tweets. Yeah. How would you grade your uh, former Wall Street Journal editorial page? They they have been fairly pro-Trump on a lot of things. Yeah, I think dismayingly so. I'm not, I mean, I think the Journal is still a great newspaper, especially with the reporting that's done by the news side, but I've been dismayed to see the extent to which uh, the editorial page has, has wound up endorsing somebody who is opposed to so many other views, I mean, on tariffs and on so many other issues. It's kind of... I mean, mind-boggling, actually, on the economic stuff. Right. It would be mind-boggling if it weren't for the fact that the whole Republican Party is, is pretty much in the same position. It's, 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 it's very dismaying. Well, we're in California, and in the book you draw a parallel um, to Pete Wilson, the um, second-to-last Republican governor, yeah. if you want to call Arnold Schwarzenegger a uh, uh, Republican. And you talk about something that I have actually been thinking about a lot since um, the election, which is what Pete Wilson's kind of anti-immigrant stances and, and Prop um, 185, 184, 185 um, did to the GOP here, that that was sort of the beginning of the end. Are, right. are you at all hopeful that this is sort of happening on the national level with Trump? I think it's inevitable because, I mean, basically what you had in California was in the 1990s, uh, Pete Wilson turned the Republican Party into the a anti-immigrant party. And of course, the demographics of California have shifted so quickly. And you have such a large Latino and Asian population that that is not a winning long-term strategy. And so I think the Republican Party in California has really been decimated by what Pete Wilson did in the 1990s. And I think it's inevitable that you're going to have something somewhere happen at the national level. It's a question of time because, you know, by 2040, uh, this country is going to be a majority minority country. And, you know, under those conditions, being the party of white resistance is not going to be a successful political ploy. Uh, the problem is, you know, a lot, an awful lot of things can happen between now and, and 2040. And in the meantime, unfortunately, young people who are very anti-Trump and minorities who are very anti-Trump tend to vote at much lower rates than grumpy old white people uh, who turn out uh, very heavily. And so that is what Trump is banking on, basically squeezing every last bit of juice out of the white vote to hold on to power. And that was a su surprisingly successful strategy uh, in uh, 2016. And, and it could be a successful strategy in 2020. I just don't think it's going to be a successful strategy in 2050. Yeah. Um, we have time for about one more question, and this is a little far afield, but a, an audience member asked, do you see a need to get money out of elections, um, perhaps such as the British system? And if you do, do you think there's any chance of it? Well, hard to have any chance of it, given where the Supreme Court stands on right. equating campaign donations with, with free speech, which is certainly a, a questionable uh, judgment. Uh, but, you know, I would not necessarily say that money is the root of all evil in politics because, I mean, if you saw the way that Donald Trump ran for office, he, he did not spend as much money as, as, as Hillary Clinton spent. He got a massive free media. He figured out how to basically take advantage of, of press coverage to get his message across. So ironically, even though Trump is a plutocrat, uh, his campaign actually showed that it's possible to beat uh, money in politics. That's not just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you're going to necessarily be successful. But I mean, I think that is something we do need to look at is, is the corrupting influence uh, of money. But, you know, I, is, I don't think you're given where the Supreme Court stands ideologically, you're not going to have a lot of success with that. So, and I don't think it's, you know, again, it's not what's really keeping Trump in, in power is not necessarily the money of a Sheldon Adelson or something like that, although it certainly helps. But I think fundamentally it's his skills as a demagogue and his ability to whip up his, his base, which he does not need a lot of money to do. And so Democrats need to figure out how to counter that uh, with an effective message instead of just, you know, grousing about money in politics. Because, in fact, I think in this election cycle, Democrats, I, I suspect, are either going to outspend 
uh, Republicans are being pretty close parity. So, you know, if Democrats lose in, in a couple of weeks' time, it's not going to be because they were outspent. Right. All right. Well, thank you. Max Boot, yeah. columnist for The Washington Post, for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to... We'd like to remind the audience here that pre-signed copies of The Corrosion of Conservatism are available for purchase in the back of the room. I'm Marisa Lagos, and this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place, you're in, the place where you're in the know, is now adjourned. Thank you.